these rocks in front of me contain silver and lead, and all of them were collected from here at Cerro Gordo, California. And over my past two years living here, I've found pockets of ore down in the main mine. I found slag piles with real high grade slag still remaining. I've even found in the dump here, pure silver ore. So in this video, we're gonna take samples from all over this mountain. We're gonna refine them and see if maybe, just maybe, the original owners of this town left millions of dollars worth of minerals behind. Who says you don't have the greatest job in the world? Huh? <laughs> All right guys, so in this video, we're gonna take a lot of assays from around Cerro Gordo. So an assay is taking a small representative sample from some location and then trying to figure out the mineral content and by that, the value of whatever that was. And so back in the day, you gotta figure these hills were just crawling with individual prospectors and they would bring in samples to the assay office, an office much like this. And the guy there would start with a sample reduce it all the way down to whatever metal they're looking for and say, hey, you know, your assay came out at 80% lead and 2% silver. So if we extrapolate this out onto a per ton basis, you know, your mine might be worth X. And individual miners would use this good assay, hopefully, to raise money, get more workers, just get more excitement around whatever their claim was. So the guy working back here, the assayer, kind of knew everything going on around a mining town. You know, he knew where the hot areas were. He knew where the not hot areas were. He knew where guys were kind of selling a lie to investors or where the guys were kind of maybe hiding a really high quality deposit. And so when a town like this would begin, and back in the day, it was about a dollar per assay, which is pretty good money, you know? You gotta figure in Cerro Gordo's heyday, the above ground miners were making $3 a day and the below ground miners were making $4 a day. And so an assayer was a very respected part of every mining town. The main refinery here was Belshaw's refinery. And Mortimer Belshaw was the main town owner back in the day. He owned the road, he owned the refinery, he owned most of the Union Mine, and him, along with his business partner, Victor Beaudry, came to own pretty much everything up here. And since owning this property, I've gotten to know a little bit more about the assaying process. You know, if you've watched, I've made small little batches of silver, larger batches of silver, some jewelry, and all these other things. I wanna take samples from different parts of the mine. You know, so far, all of my ores came from the same place, but there was 30 miles of mines here at Cerro Gordo, and there's other mines on our property that weren't the main union mine. All right, so why? Why are we doing these different assays of different parts of the property and different pockets of ore? I think for me it's twofold. First is just a better understanding of history. You know, that's what I'm always trying to do with these videos is just better understand the history of Cerro Gordo. Uh, it's also interesting to think about the town from that financial perspective that Belshaw and Beaudry might have. You know, every day I walk by these giant piles of slag. You know, I always knew that passively this slag might have some mineral content in it, but there's tons of it up here, like literal tons, like truckloads of this slag that still exists. And when I was reading through a history book the other day, I read that 40% of the ore is left behind. And I think this light bulb went off. And I was like, wait a second. Am I just walking by thousands and thousands of dollars literally laying on the ground every single day? Many people have made a lot of money going to these old mining towns and re-refining the slag. And so my curiosity is how much silver is still in that slag? You know, this could be sitting on literally not a gold mine, but a silver mine worth of value if this is still high quality. And luckily, on this adventure, I have a very special guest. And that guest is Jason from Mount Baker Mining. And Jason's both come here, and I've flown to Washington, and we've made a variety of different silver items in the past. Jason has been kind enough to come back, so our first stop is gonna be between the 400 and 500 level of the mine. You know, that's where I've been taking most of my ore out of. Um, so I want to take Jason there first, get a good sample, and uh, see what happens. 
All right, Jason, so we're up at the hoist house and you're kind of the inspiration behind why I started smelting some metal up here. Yeah. And I took a lot of inspiration from your shop uh, in Washington. I don't want to go as far as calling this a shop, but this is where I attempt to melt metal. So I'll give you a look and then maybe you have some suggestions on how I can improve it. And then from there, uh, we're going to head down to the mine and grab some samples, but uh, come on over. Cool, I'll show yeah, you. Look, let's see what we got here. <laughs> Uh, this is the furnace we're going to use today. I uh, think it's going to work out pretty good. I think so. Yeah. No, this is great. This is this is a, a little bit of an upgrade from mine. <laughs> but yeah, it's the same concept. It's KO wool insulation inside. You're going to set your crucible down in there. Yep. Cover it. Get it really, really hot. Yep. And then when it's ready, we'll take it out and we'll pour it. We're going to pour it into this. This is a, a cone mold. I went to a scrap yard in Bishop and we got this made. And the decision to make three instead of four plates on that was a very long one. But it works. Over here is kind of our rest of our stuff. We have our cupels over here. So this is uh, what's going to allow the lead to oxidize out and leave just behind silver. We have our crucibles, which we're gonna heat stuff up in. Uh, we have the thermometer, you know how hot we're getting. How hot are we gonna try to get this today? I'm hoping we can get it 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, about right. 1100 degrees Celsius for the rest of the world. All right, so that's <laughs> what we're shooting for. And uh, we got our soda ash, or as close as we can get over here. And I'm sure we can find some iron around. This is a classic uh, crucible failure. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we got that a little too hot. Yeah, and you learn, uh, this is how you learn things. This is this is an important lesson. So <laughs> that's cool. You got that out of the way. Here's a here's a small bead of silver oh, nice. that we ended up with, yeah. kind of. This was found here at Cerro Gordo as well. Okay, cool. This so, is yeah. So this is like this is probably purposely built for assays. Right. Like it just yeah. holds the amount of for an the, assay. Yeah, yeah. For the assay. So that's cool. I think we can make something happen. All right, yeah, yeah. good. It's well ventilated at the very least. Yeah. If nothing else, this is well ventilated. That's probably the most important part. That's, <laughs> what, that's really what you want, is, is the ventilation. All right, radios are good. We are going to head down to the 400 level. And in between the 400 and 500, there's a pocket of ore that we're gonna try to get out. How are you feeling? I'll let you know when we get to the 400 level. <laughs> <laughs> So this is our uh, mode of transport here, and we are going to slowly descend quite a ways down. Right now, the only way to enter the Union Mine is using the original shaft from the 1800s, and it slowly lowers you in a cage down this 900 foot hole with a cable above you. And we're headed down. <laughs> Have you been on a lot of skips before? I, I have not. I, this is the most unique one I've ever been yeah. on, let me tell you that. This is... <laughs> it's pretty standard. Right. It's a little more open than I'm used to. Yep. But yeah, this is how they used to do it. This is how they'd get down. All day. I think this is cool. Like, this is someone's like grease cup, I guess. Oh yeah, wild. <laughs> you can see they just kind of were branching everywhere, but we're gonna head this way. No tracks? Have you pulled the track? Yeah, I pulled the track. It must have been an old, old working zig. And then you can see that's like super sketchy over there, whatever they were doing there. Oh, sure, all timbered up and stalled up, yeah. This is gonna do a classic ghost town living move and hook. <laughs> All right, I'm down to the landing, so if you want to come down. All right, so we're down to the first landing. Now Jason's coming down. Oh, yeah. It's like riding a bike. Yeah, back at it. Yeah. Now's when it gets a little fun. <laughs> okay, well, that wasn't the fun part. <laughs> so we're going down that. And speaking of timbering work, that's some pretty, I mean, imagine the guy that had to build this box. That's beautiful work. So we're going to go down this box. Right at the end of this is the Galena that we're going after. Oh, cool. It looks like this was the manway and that's over there was the ore. Yeah, ore shoot. I believe so. Yeah, because I've walked up that too. And I think this was the manway. And over here, there's still a ladder in that one too, actually. Oh, really? But if you look over there too, they had a short going there. And when we get down to there, there's this huge chute that goes down to the next level of the mine. It goes all the way to the 550 level. Oh boy, there goes all the tools. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, so I'm down if you want to come down. Okay. All right, so this is the ledge I was talking about. Uh, you can still see that's kind of what I was hoping to get at today. Yeah. Um, I just saw some on the ground. Um, you can see from my previous attempts to get some out. But down there is where it kind of gets real interesting. Oh, yeah. That goes down to the 550 foot level of the mine. Uh huh. There is a ladder off to the right to get there, but it's very sketchy and broken in a lot of places. Okay. And then there's still some stuff on the ground from last time. Is this where you got the ore from? That Half of the stuff that I brought to you, yeah, came okay. from here. So what uh, what are your impressions of the mineralization, I guess? I think it's great. I yeah. think, yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously this massive galena you got here. Yep. And that's obviously where the silver and the lead are gonna be running. It's much more mixed than I've seen in other places. Other places, you only see the galena. You know, here it looks to be in like all sorts of weird rock. Uh -huh. um, yeah, hopefully we can collect enough to do a sample or something. Yeah. Go with hands, first off. Well, there you go. Oh, oh yeah. There you go, that's yeah. nice. That's the winner. Yeah, look at there. That's what we want. We're adding up fast. Yeah, I know. We're gonna be retired before too long. <laughs> you wanna get in there? Sure, I'll get in there. I'll, yeah. do, I'll do the double. Uh... Yeah. You took all the good stuff. Yep. That's a good piece. There we go. There's some nice stuff in there. You see that? Yes. <laughs> We're gonna get that piece. Here it comes. Oh, oh! There's some. Look at that. Get everything. Let's get as much as we can, even these scraps, and yeah. go turn it into some lead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's do it. See how it got really narrow? Yeah. So I can take the tools and stuff probably first, too. So. Not that, not that. Let me just put them up to safety. How's that? Who says you don't have the greatest job in the world? <laughs> okay. Well, we're back up with our haul. We made it. The one piece. Yeah. Uh, so what do you think? You think we got enough? I think we got enough. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I think we got enough to play with and do some assays for you. And yeah. maybe we can get some back to Washington and I yeah. can, uh, turn into something cool for you. Heck yeah. All right, so once the first sample was secured from the Union Mine, the next mine we're gonna go to is the Newtown Mine. And the Newtown Mine is a really old mine. It's a mine from the 1870s here at Cerro Gordo that's just beyond the saddle. And Jason is volunteered to scrape a little bit of the Galena left in this tiny pocket from the ceiling. So we're gonna go down there, scrape out some Galena, and try to get that as our second sample in this whole test batch. Next, and probably the easiest sample to get, we're gonna take a sample from the actual dump here at Cerro Gordo. You know, this waste dump is the big piles of rocks that you see as you're watching these videos. And so over the last few months, I've gone through and collected a number of pieces of Galena from the dump itself. You know, I can't give the exact level these came from, but there is a relatively decent amount of Galena in the dump. And so that is already ground up. That's something I found in the past. So we're gonna use that as our next sample. And then finally, we're gonna use a sample from the old Belshaw smelter. I remember, the point of all this is to try to determine how much of this precious metal is left behind. And if I'm walking past literal dollars just laying on the ground all around me every day. Uh, what do you think, Jason? Pretty good stuff? I think it's great stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's Galena, you know, it's that lead sulfide. A lot of silver is going to be in there. A lot of it is is very pure, you know, it's very, very heavy. There's a few pieces we might need to clean up a little bit. Yeah. But I think overall, we got a lot of good lead here we're gonna get out. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and reduce the galena down to lead metal. And then once it's down in the lead metal form, we have the lead and silver together. We're gonna remove all the lead and figure out how much silver we have in this stuff. And this has been done since the Roman times, right? There's, there's two main ways it's been done up here at Cerro Gordo. The first one and the original way it was done was in these big, huge hearth furnaces. They took all this galena, they piled it in this furnace, and then they, they lit a fire under it and roasted it. And they, they pushed all this hot oxygenated air up through it 
and all the sulfur connected to the, the lead atoms was oxidized and it went up into the atmosphere. So now you have all this lead oxide sitting in this furnace and it's really hot. And then they introduced carbon, probably in the form of coal or wood. And that carbon is active enough to where once that carbon is introduced to that lead oxide, it pulls the oxygen off the lead oxide and reduces it down to the lead metal. And then they could pour bars or bullion or whatever, and then they, they shipped it off. What we're gonna do today is a little bit different. We're gonna take the raw ore and we're gonna take soda ash, which is a very basic alkaline flux. And we're gonna use uh, iron nails. And we're gonna put all that in a crucible and get it really, really hot. And so the iron will actually suck all the sulfur off of the galena and reduce it right in the crucible, right down to the lead metal. And when we pour that into a cone mold, you're gonna get a, a thing that looks like this with a little bit of lead prill on the bottom and slag on top. So that's the plan, let's yeah. see if it works. So the goal here is to basically, we're gonna start with galena, end up with silver, and that'll be a representative sample. And so then we could say, hey, if you were to take a ton of this out, you would probably get about this much silver per ton. Mm -hmm. That's the goal, right? That's the plan. Right. Yeah, two samples going. So we got one from the 400, one from the dump. The two other ones are from the dump and from the new town. Early bets, if you had to guess which one is gonna be highest grade, what would you guess? I'm gonna guess the dump. New town. New town. All right. I guess then I'll take the 400 level. All right, so as you can see, we have our cones for the ground up galena we had and from the 400 level. So the hope here is that the lead and or silver would have sank to the bottom of this. And we're gonna break off the top slag, leaving behind just a little bit of both lead and silver, which will then put in a cupel. This will allow the lead to oxidize into it and leave behind a tiny bit of silver, at which point we'll do the math. There we go. Yeah. Pretty quickly. Yeah. That one looks pretty big. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, the new town weighs 43.89. Wow. That's a lot. That, yeah, because that, I was out of 50. Yeah. You know, new town may be a great lead mine mm -hmm. and not a great silver mine or, you know, vice right. versa. So far, if we were to look, uh, the dump number one is 77.5% uh, lead and silver. The 400 level is 71.48% lead and silver. The new town is 87% lead and silver. And the dump number two is only 11.5% lead and silver. So now that shows that all the waste rock is out of there. So now we get down to business. Now we see how much of this remaining stuff is actually silver. Unfortunately, none of my dig digital scales were accurate enough to do the final bit of the process. So Jason took off uh, and I ordered a scale. But I think in the meantime, that smelting bug had bit, you know, I kept thinking, what are other things that I'm curious to know the mineral content of? All right, so we have the four samples. The fifth and potentially most exciting is a piece of galena that fell out of the old aerial tramway system here at Cerro Gordo. So back in the day in the zinc era, so in the 1910s, they were still mining a little bit of galena and they put in an aerial tramway. So imagine these buckets that would swing and go all the way down to Keeler. And if you guys have been watching this channel for a while, you know that over a year ago, I took a hike all the way down the tramway. It was very exhausting, but along that hike, I found some very high quality galena. And now the reason that this galena is very exciting to me is because so far, everything that we assayed would have been stuff that they left behind here. You know, even in the mine, that was probably not high quality enough for them to even mess with. The dump, the same, the slag, the new town, all of the above. But this was obviously galena that they cared about enough to try to send down on one of these buckets. And what must have happened was the bucket would have swayed in the wind and dropped it out. I'm gonna try to get as far as I can there just with the truck. And I have a few people joining me. You know, I have some great volunteers up here. I think we got Keegan, Trevor, and Matt are all gonna join. And you know, I gotta figure, if this is the stuff that they wanted to send down, I'm excited to see what the quality would have been like in its heyday. So with that, we need to gather some stuff and we're gonna hit the road.
All right, we're off. So where we're headed is that first tower, then down that hill ways, there's some Galena that's fallen off. And so we first have to go there. We'll show you guys a little bit of the tramway and then hike down. You know, this whole thing just felt like an investigation into history. You know, that we were fact checking the history books and maybe adding our own new history to those books. And I think about that type of stuff a lot. You know, and as we were walking down the tramway, I thought, you know, at one point in time, this tramway was somebody's whole life. You read about it in the books, but you have to think, when it was constructed, it was the guy who engineered its whole life. It was the guy who built its whole life. It was the guy that worked its whole life. It was literally the life of hundreds of different people. And then one day it wasn't, you know, and then suddenly it was just abandoned and it wasn't anybody's life anymore. And I try to think about that a lot here at Cerro Gordo. And I think one of the things that brings me the most pleasure in these videos is just bringing that history to life a little bit, you know, shining a light back on it, even if just for a moment. You know, I don't know if that's good karma with all the people that once put their life and blood into the tram, but to me, it makes the whole experience here more vivid. You know, it makes the history come alive to me and it makes my time here that much richer. And so as we were walking on the tram, I just kept thinking about how did they get these boards here? You know, how did they possibly construct something like this? How did they have the audacity to do that? And I love that part of this channel. This is the first station, we are going down past that next one, down that cliff. And if my memory serves me right, about halfway down this hill on the left is the piece we're looking for. You can still see a lot of the tramway. So this was put in by Gordon during the zinc era. Just imagine getting this stuff here, you know, because the closest road is over there. Nothing was easy back in the day to get. And so if we're going to sample some ore, let's sample some ore that's hard to get. I remember correctly, this piece was by a yucca plant that stabbed me, made me bleed. And so it was right next to that, if I remember correctly. But I also think that we left one ore bucket up here. Somewhere around this bush. I remember it was green because it had a decent copper content to it as well. Oh, I think I see a piece. There she is. Heavy, heavy Galena. There's not a ton, but there's a decent amount. You see all the copper content? That's why it's green. This obviously is right along the bucket line. So this sort of swaying out of the bucket. So that's more than enough to do the sample. Pretty early on in this video, uh, the scope expanded dramatically. You know, there's that term mission creep where your mission creeps and creeps and creeps. Uh, that is exactly what happened in this video. I think the excitement of getting better at assaying took over and suddenly all of these things started flashing through my head. You know, the slag, the ore that was dropped from the tramway, all these different things that I now had the skills to truly figure out jumped into my mind and I got excited and I just Went a little overboard with the ass saying, but that's cool. You know, that's what happens as you learn these new skills. I think there's a excitement and a happiness that comes along with that. And I think that was really evident as I started making this video. This is stuff that fell from the tram. So we'll assay that, see if that's any higher quality than the other stuff. But that'll be the fifth and final assay from around Cerro Gordo. Now, as soon as I broke it open, it just looked so much higher grade than any of the other stuff that we had. You know, the glitter was just everywhere on this piece that we retrieved from the hike. And so I got that down to the lead and silver. And unfortunately, I then ran into the problem that I needed the digital scale. So while I was waiting for that scale to be delivered, I started thinking about the two main owners of Cerro Gordo. And the two main owners of Cerro Gordo were a Mr. Mortimer Belshaw, who had great chops back in the day, and a Mr. Victor Beaudry, and they owned the smelters. And there's two smelters, uh, one built in 1868, owned by Mortimer Belshaw, which is up the hill that way, 
and one built two years later in 1870, owned by Victor Beaudry, which is just down the way this way. So right now, behind me, you see the Beaudry Furnace. So back in the day, there used to be a giant wooden building behind this chimney, and they were using 80 tons of charcoal per day here, making over 200 bars, 80 pound bars, every single day. And so for me, what's interesting about this is left behind is the slag. But if you were to pick it up, it still has a good weight to it, so there's still gotta be lead in here. And so when I was thinking about it, what I'm curious to do is to take a sample from the Beaudry smelter, take a sample from the Belshaw smelter, and really in this case, we're actually looking for who had the least amount of silver and lead left behind, because that would have been the person doing the best job of refining it. All right, now we are up to the site of Belshaw's furnace. And Belshaw built his furnace right here on this ridge back in 1868. And up here, you know, originally, these smelters would lose about 40% of the production in the slag. So you can still see the black slag all around here. And I think Belshaw at its peak, he was getting 60 tons of ore per day out of the Union Mine. And so down here, if they're doing 23 tons of his smelter, which they positioned it here so they could kind of just throw all the slag off the cliff, it's actually up there. So you can see in the cliff, all this old slag. And so, if they were losing even 10% times 23 tons times, Belshaw had his furnace running 24 hours per day for years, there's still a lot of silver here in this mountain. And so when you look at this, you can see kind of the glassy residue. So I'm gonna take this piece, if I can get out of here, and we're gonna go up, refine this, see how much silver he left behind and lead, and try to do the math on if he was leaving that times 23 tons per day, how much that might be in today's dollars. All right, we're back. We have this from Belshaw, this from Beaudry, and we're gonna see which of the bullion kings left more silver behind and who was wasting the most money. That is the result of the Beaudry re-smelting. Not an ideal situation, but uh, there might be a little silver in that. I saw, I thought I saw some melted lead and silver go in that, so we're gonna test that out. It doesn't look the best, does it? And so this is the Belshaw slag. We come over here to the Beaudry slag. If you didn't get it all, because if you look at the very bottom of that, so that is lead and silver. That was left behind. And now we're gonna see if Mr. Belshaw left any behind in his slag. Oh, they both left some behind. Belshaw might have left a lot behind in his slag. It's a lot of lead. Belshaw, you're leaving money on the table. So far, that's how much Belshaw left behind. That's how much Beaudry left behind. This times 28 tons per day. There's a lot of lead that was left behind. All right guys, so the big time is here. The scale is in the house. It is leveled out. So we have seven total weighings to do. So we are gonna start with dump number one, which we started with 50 grams of Galena. We ended up with 38.74 of lead and silver, which is 77.5%. And now we're gonna take that and we have 0.14 grams of silver. So given that we started with 50 grams, that's 0.28% silver, and that's not a lot. And today's going rate for silver is $22.26, and the going rate for lead is about 45 cents. 
So that equals about $1,987 worth of silver and $655 worth of lead for a grand total of $2,642 per ton for the dump number one sample. The highest would have been Newtown, so it seems Scotty was right so far, at 3,400 per ton. Next, 400 level at just over 3,000 per ton. Next, dump number one at about $2,600 per ton. And then finally, dump number two at $390 per ton, which I do not think is worth it. So the math is in on our fifth assay, and this is the one of the piece of Galena that fell out of the bucket and the results might surprise you. This is a grand total of 1,976. This actually, by per ton, was the lowest, even lower than our dump one. It wasn't as low as dump two. Dump two is almost a discard, but it would seem that right now, if we were able to get the amount of tonnage that Belshaw was doing a day, let's say Belshaw was doing 30 tons a day, and we're doing that out of the Newtown mine, we would be getting about $103,000 per day out of the Newtown mine. That's gross. Obviously, you're gonna have costs related to that. And so that is that. But you can see where the math started adding up for these guys. All right, now since comparing the business partners, we know that Belshaw was leaving $715 per ton behind. Uh, Beaudry was doing a lot better. He only was leaving 4.4% behind when Belshaw was leaving 32% behind. $108 per ton is what Beaudry's slag was worth. It was probably not worth it to re-refine that even at the time. That's pretty good. So Belshaw was seven times less efficient than Beaudry, which I think is interesting. So Mr. Belshaw, for a Bullion King, you were leaving behind 32% in your waste rock, which times 32 tons per day, and $6 million worth of ore every single year in his slag. So the fact that Belshaw was leaving behind 32% of his ore to me is just mind blowing. I mean, this this is literally gonna have to update the record books, you know, because everybody says they pulled $500 million worth of minerals out of the mountain. They pulled way more of that. They just left half of it here. Now, obviously this isn't taking into account the refining process, but if you are a refinery out there and you want to take on some slag from Cerro Gordo and make it into some lead and silver, hit me up is the Belshaw slag that we've been uh, re-refining. So this is worth about $715 per ton. And so I think tomorrow we're gonna go try to collect some of this. Uh, we do have this really special silver that we are gonna make into something towards the end of this video. So stay tuned. Behind the scenes is Mr. Matt. And so Matt has been uh, doing a lot of this refining as well, going through the process with me. What do you think about the results so far? Pretty good, not too bad. What do you think about Belshaw leaving that behind? I think we're about to make a lot of money. Yes, that's what we need to hear. <laughs> we need some money to build a hotel, and, and so tomorrow, uh, you up for uh, picking up some slag? Oh yeah. All right. Yeah. All right, so if you're ever interested, this is what one ton of slag looks like. All right, so all of those little beads that we made through all these different assaying processes that came from the new town, came from the union, came from the tramway, we combined them all into what we're gonna call a coin. That is a generous interpretation of what this is, but it is stamp CG, and this is a piece of Saragoro history because it's coming from every part of this mountain pretty much. And so as a small thank you, if you look below, there'll be a way to get this for free, just giving it away to one lucky person. And so thank you all so, so much for following along with this. This was a lot of fun. You kind of saw curiosity take us in all sorts of different areas. So thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Chris. And uh, until next time, sign up below if you want this cool coin. <laughs>
truly amazing. And it also just allowed us to make history. You know, I don't think that's an overstatement. I think in this video, realizing how much ore Dalsha was leaving behind has never been done before. To see with our own calculations that Belsha was leaving literally millions of dollars worth of ore behind every single year is news, it's history. You know, it's gotta be mentioned when we mentioned the total amount pulled out of here, it's, we have to mention the amount left behind. Uh, I think this was an amazing week and I thank you guys so, so much for following along. You know, whether you're here or just watching online, you truly are making this all possible. And you're allowing this dream to come to life. So I just wanna say thank you all so, so much. I hope for this next week that you do get out there and learn some new skill, you know, whether it's assing or otherwise, you know, and I hope that you find a way to combine those skills eventually into some beautiful fashion. And so with that, thank you all so, so much. Uh, I hope you have an amazing week and I will see you all next time.